All right, technical debt. This is a little story about technical debt. Uh, what are you risking, right? So this is the US national debt. We are now, as of last night, at $27 trillion. Uh, your share is only 217,000. So if you just want to make a check out to the US government and help pay this off, you only need to pay about 217,000. That shouldn't be a problem for some of you. It is a problem for me. <laughs> Interestingly, our GDP, debt, debt to GDP is 154% now. So we owe more than the country produces. Fortunately, we don't have to pay this debt off. In perspective, I would say your technical debt, your debt is not this bad. And hopefully it's not this bad. If it's this bad, I would I'd be very worried. Um, so, but I thought this was very interesting, but this is not the, technical debt we're talking about. This is not the debt that we're going to cover today, fortunately, because we would never solve this problem. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. This is the agenda. We'll do an intro, background, uh, before open source, after open source, high level stats. How did we get into debt? But more importantly, how do we get out of debt? And what am I risking? So my name is Sal Padilla, for those uh, if you didn't hear. Um, I am in, or used to be an enterprise DevOps. I was the DevSecOps architect for that company. Um, is this still DevSecOps? What are, what are we calling it now? DevOps, DevSecOps? I'm calling it DevSecOps. Uh, we want security in the mix. <laughs> that was a long debate we had on LinkedIn. That was pretty fun. It was. Yes, it was. It, it was. Uh, in, it, it was interesting to see where people's thoughts were on on that. Um, so I am also an engineer, and as a along with an architect, because I'm still fairly hands on. Uh, I am an evangelist, so I could talk about DevOps all day. I have 30 plus years of development and DevOps experience. I was in software development for 20 something years and then DevOps for the last 10 something years. So I've been doing DevOps for quite some time. Uh, previously enterprise DevOps architect for the largest energy company in the US. So that was a pretty big, um, pretty big uh, installation. And currently I am the I'm a principal consultant for Infosys. So yes, you can hire me. I am now a gun for hire if you want. Um, but let's talk about technical debt. If you don't care about risk uh, or security, then this might not be of much interest to you. But, but if you care about security, if you care about breaches into your uh, network and your applications and your data, if you care about quality and performance, then this may be of interest to you. So how did we, how did we get into debt? Right? Who remembers what life was like before open source? So does that computer look familiar to anybody other than me? Because <laughs> that would be bad. Oh, that computer probably only had about 16 megabytes of RAM, not gigabytes, megabytes of RAM. Programming in C or Pascal or basic, which is not around anymore probably. Um, but that does bring back some memories. So 0%, what was 0%? Can anybody guess what 0% was? Mm. 
zero percent was um Brian says it's no code. Right. <laughs> How much no code zero? Yeah, actually it was no open source code in those days, uh, which wasn't that long ago actually. Um, how much, it was 0% was how much of your application code was open source. That's probably not even 15 years ago. All of your code was written from scratch, right? We wrote all the code. Uh, later on, we started getting some libraries from folks like Microsoft, right? And that helped speed things up a little bit. But for, for the most part, we wrote all of the code. Eighty-five percent. So can everybody guess what eighty-five percent is? I can, but I don't think it's fair because I think we created that statistic. <laughs> <laughs> 80, I don't, I can't see the chat actually, but I don't know um, if anybody's doing a chat. Yeah, they are. If you mouse over the bottom of your screen, uh, it'll fly up and then you can click the chat button there and see what everybody's talking about. Let's see. I'm trying to, oh, I just. I just showed you the answer. 85, um, actually, Mark, if you can read the chat off, that would be actually helpful. Sure. Michael says 87.93% uh, of statistics are just made up in the moment. <laughs> close, close. I think Michael just made that one up. 85% <laughs> is how much of your application code is now open source? So in modern software development, the way we write code, the applications these days, you could expect up to 85% of your application is open source code. So we went from zero to 85%, which to me seems like overnight. And the 15%, that's left is really just business logic, right? Or some glue code to basically glue all the logic open source code together. And this is this this was a huge paradigm shift. This is incredible. We started delivering, mm -hmm. writing and delivering applications at amazing speed because we were no longer writing the bulk of the code. We just had to glue everything together. So, but does anyone remember what their thoughts were about open source when it first came out? I'm watching the chat room here. Just giving people a second. It says untrusted, says Brian. Right. We, um, We, we are very uh, <laughs> eerie of using open source when it, when it first started coming out because it was, again, yes, untrusted. We weren't sure what kind of code. We were actually had, um, in our company, we, were, we had an idea or someone wanted, if we wanted to use open source, someone said we had to look at all the code and we were like, that's not possible um, before we could even use it. So we said, well, that, that's not gonna work. Yeah, we have a, a bunch of answers here on that one too, is what, what did you think about it? Um, Jonathan says, awesome, <laughs> is not secure, which Lincoln, I'm surprised there because when we first started using open source to build projects, security wasn't thought of in this sense. It was just, man, this is so much easier. I can just get, grab this framework and be able to go. So I'm surprised that you, you were thinking of security right off the bat. Yes, I mean, with, with, with open source, we're really powerful open, open source like Spring. When, I, when Spring first came out, um, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of hesitancy to use it because it was so invasive to your, mm -hmm. your um, application and to your network. Mm -hmm. it, 
it was you let spring do so much right um but then again but now everyone's using spring so it, everyone just grew to trust it but in in those days um this wasn't just a simple widget right of code that just displays something this was connecting to your internal systems like LDAP and, and security systems. So that was, that was very, that was, that took us some time to really get comfortable with that. But now everyone's using it and everyone uses it to basically do the security with Spring Security. But so we've come a long way, but, and we're developing applications so much faster now. 51%, anyone want to guess what 51% is? Is it 51%, any guesses? I'm not seeing anything come through. Okay. People up to date. Hmm. People up to date? That's what Brian says, people up to date on their code. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's actually up to date on all the code and application these days with, with development teams developing um, parts of the application. Does anyone ever actually know what all the code is these days? Right, right. And, and now they've gone into tiers. You have a UI team, you have a backend team, right? you have a middleware team. And so nobody knows exactly what's in everybody's code these days. And it's very, I've, what I've seen is very difficult to get those things to talk, those layers to get talked together if they don't collaborate very well. It becomes like, oh my, this is broken. What, why is this broken? And it, it, we're, every day we're just fixing problems of why is the application is not working. But 51% back to the statistic. Um, how much is, open source has known vulnerabilities. So that's about half of all the open source libraries being used by developers. Well, Sal, can you identify that? Are you talking JavaScript? Are you talking Java? What are you talking about? This was probably from Java, from the Java world. From okay. NPM, it's probably, from the NPM world, it's probably even higher. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's so much, it's so yeah. new, and the folks writing that those so, uh, ha, are more newer to. They're probably younger, right? So in the old days, security was was uh, at the forefront of of our thought process. And I believe these days that's not the case with 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 newer developers. They're just wanting to. Uh, new features, new cool features out there without really thinking about um, security. So I'm really, with, when you're talking about things like NPM, that would probably, that statistic's probably higher. That's even, which is a little bit scary actually. But we're looking about half your code has known vulnerabilities. Half the libraries you're using has known vulnerabilities. So. How did I get into debt, right? You quite simply wrote custom code. That's once you started writing custom code, you basically started incurring technical debt. I don't know if you realized that was happening. I'm sure your business folks didn't realize that was happening, but yeah, just writing custom code and you're, you started incurring debt. And like most, good IT shops would do, they, they started scanning their code using scanning tools like um, SonarCube for quality or a Nexus IQ or Black Duck for open source libraries, security scans, vulnerability scans. And maybe they're using check marks or Veracode or Fortify for um, security vulnerabilities of, of, of their code that they're writing, right? And what's happening is these, these scans are, are 
finding all these potential defects in your application that if goes unchecked could be disastrous, right? So that is the downside of the scanning tools. While you're creating, you're, you're, you're working towards better quality of your code and your applications, you're also incurring technical debt. So how do before we get- you, I'm sorry, before you move on, yeah. we've got a couple questions here. Thomas yeah. asks, do you think that younger developers expect more security to be built in from the start? Is there an assumption now with the new developers? Yeah. Security, well, let's talk about security for a minute there. So application security, uh, from, a, from, from his perspective, yes, it should be. Security is not something you want your every new developer, any developer to be um, have a hand in actually. That security framework really should be well established um, in the beginning. And it's generally your a core group of developers or that that is writing or maintaining that security framework. It's so what should be done, and we did this at, at other places, is we, we write basically our own security libraries that we basically hand hand over to the developer de, develop the dev teams to use, right? So from his perspective, yes, it sh, it's not something um, developers should be having to deal with, right? It's just something that's given to them and and for them to use. Call this, right. call that, right? right? But how does that relate to open source components? If I go and download an open source component, is my basic assumption now that because of all the notoriety that it's going to be relatively safe? Ye well, that's a good question. Let me come back to that one because okay. I think there's a there's a slide where we talk about that all right then we've got another question here this is so many vulnerabilities are undisclosed to the masses until their use has waned my question is when you say known vulnerability known by who the public the researchers who knows the vulnerability so for example um, I've implemented Nexus IQ. So, and, and I'm very familiar with Nexus IQ. Uh, I'm not as familiar with how Black Duck does it, but there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, no, there's a, there's a group that publishes uh, vulnerabilities around open source. I can't remember the exact name of it. But Sonatype, the, the, the vendor for Nexus IQ, um, also has their own folks, right? So, so there's a central group that is looking at it, at the open source vulnerabilities, but then you also have the Sonatype folks with their own folks um, going through those with whatever is published and also finding their own. And I'm sure they published back to the central, um, central, um, central uh, group. But there is a central group, and I don't remember. Mark, do you remember what that central group is called? Are you talking about the CVS? Uh, everything? Yeah. That, or, yeah. Right. Um, I can go and look it up. I don't. I always remember the acronym. I don't even <laughs> remember the name anymore. Right. <laughs> I, I'm. I'm pretty sure Black Duck subscribes to that. Um, same group, but basically there is a group that is looking at the open source vulnerabilities. But the um, I know I have another client that's also using Nexus IQ, and but they Sonatype also has their own folks. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm just reading from the, the chat room. That was good. CVE, Common Vulnerability and Exposures. There's a group that actually manages that whole process. 
I think that's what you're talking about. Um, are we uh, slowing down your presentation or do you want more questions? I got more coming. Um, no, we're good. All right. Paul says, what questions should developers be asking if they don't hear from their teams about security components? So if there is not anything built in, if there's not an automated process for looking at components, uh, what, should, uh, what should developers be asking? Let me table that one too, because there's another slide that talks about that. That's fair enough. Let's move on. Okay. So how do we get out of debt, right? We don't, we don't give the government $217,000, that's for sure. But like any debt, you, you should be making regular payments, right? Um, so you don't want to, you don't need to spend a big lump sum. You don't need to pay it off $27 trillion, right? You just pay it off gradually. It's just like buying, it's like paying off your new Tesla, right? You're, you make monthly payments. You can drive the folks around and impress everyone in your new Tesla, but at the fourth week, you can need to make a payment. It can't always be about features. Uh, Microsoft has said this long ago. Actually, Microsoft um, prioritizes security over features. But you need to do some housekeeping. So maybe every fourth or fifth sprint, you dedicate to technical debt. But for the ones that are high priority, you need to work those into your sprint. But maybe every fourth or fifth sprint, you just dedicate to technical debt. Yeah, you're not going to see any new flashy, flashy features that's going to be sh that you can show off. But it needs to be done, right? So what can you do? What else can you do? Don't spend, right? Sonantype, for example, has an IDE plugin for Eclipse, IntelliJ, Video, Visual Studio for Nexus IQ, where you can find your vulnerabilities, open source vulnerabilities as code is being developed. Right, I'm sure the other tools have this similar, similar thing. Sonar Cube um, has an IDE plugin called Sonar Lint, so you could do that. You can get quality um, scanning while you're developing your code, writing your code. Um, you could do uh, OSS scanning while you're writing the code. Make sure that anything mm -hmm. you're using is safe to use. So you save on technical debt by not creating more, right? You create a culture where writing good code is expected and rewarded. So this is not a fun thing, right? So we try, we, at my last company, we thought, well, how can we gamify, right? How can we gamify um, this behavior? Where we where developers write want to write good code, right? They're in they're incentivized to write good code. So maybe you, you create a game where the team that has the least or is trending the best around technical debt, where their their technical debt is going down, um, they win something, right? win a lunch, whatever, um, which when we get back to the office could be good or <laughs> everyone gets to go take out. Um, but that could be something you can do. So maybe you gamify it, but you create this culture where you on like the old cliche shift left, right? You're shifting the quality to, and security left where the code is being uh, written. Um, invest wisely. So this is kind of along that question. Um, what if you're not hearing anything, right? I think. So this is very important. Uh, you, you need to create a governance model around open source um, 
consumption or live usage mm -hmm. within your company. So you're going to need your sourcing and compliance group for the folks because you need to make sure the, the open source licenses that are associated with those components can be used within your company. You're not um, exposing your company to any legal issues with the licensing. Your cybersecurity group, of course, needs to be in there because they need to see, um, they need to basically vet and um, approve any open source components being used by your application within your company if it's within a certain threshold right you, you they probably won't allow criticals and highs but they may apply they may allow mediums right um and then you also need your enterprise software development governance group uh, most folk most companies have that where um you have your mostly architects and lead tech leads, but they all need to come together and agree and create a plan on developing standards and processes around open source usage. Um, when you get all those groups together, you get their buy-in, um, you create DevSecOps champions to help socialize this. But what what should be happening is the 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 if you if you're if you're doing your development um if, if you're doing your development and you're doing your scanning during development and then you're also doing your scanning around in your pipeline and you're scanning on every build or every other build or month or week however you want to do it um there needs to be those those results of those scans are are available or pushed to your dev teams as far as what is what what the scans are finding right so you find it while you're developing you find it during a scan and your your dev teams and your product owners it's up to them to to prioritize those those defects and make sure they're taken care of. So one of the things you want to discuss with your OSS governance, stra uh, governance is around strategy. There's, there's several strategies you could take around open source. Um, you could block everything, which some folks do that. You can block nothing and find it later on um, before it's deployed to production during the um, during the development phase and testing phase, right? Or you can block some things. Um, another shameless plug for um, Sonotype is they have Nexus IQ firewall, which is actually pretty nice. So you can block some things with, with um, certain rules. Like for example, you will block things where license classification could be license banned. So anything with license banned won't even come into your company's ecosystem. They, they, your, your dev teams won't be able to use those, those components. Um, so that's another way you could handle it. I've, and it really depends on the size of your company and the number of developers, how far you are, how, how much of a, how much you have already have within your ecosystem, or if you're starting out um, new, which probably not, you could block everything and do it that way and do a whitelist, right? You could do a whitelist. We've done that. I've done that before. It's doable, um, but at scale, it might not be. So you really need to think through that. So does that answer the other question about if you're not hearing anything? I'm not seeing anything following up, so I think you did good. Okay, any questions around governance? One of the things that people might, and you might touch on this too, Sal, to make sure people understand, that governance too can be part of an automation process. Ye oh, your, yeah, your automation process will definitely feed in, 
into that governance model uh, because because your automation is doing is finding all that right mm. it is finding all the libraries and code that um, could potentially expose your company right so the process your automation is going to be part of your process your governance process and whether you want to create tickets from those scans um, tracking them is also uh, an it, it depends on what your company has for ticketing and tracking if you do in jira you if you have a ticket system like gs now you could do it that way so it's really up to you to define the governance people process and tools right mm. but it you should you def definitely have to do that so the net other thing about investing wisely um, is you want to create a core working team on cleaning up and maintaining rules and policies that these scanning tools are using. Um, these, these rules and policies um, can create unnecessary technical debt. So you want to go through each rule and policy and you may want to change their rating. Perhaps you may not think they're high or critical. Maybe you want to downgrade it. Maybe you want to upgrade it. Maybe the threshold is too low. So if it, uh, so, I mean, for example, if, it, if we've tweaked numbers on sonar cube, but if it's this many, nah, that's not too bad. Let's change it to double that. And if it gets double that, then we flag it. So you'll need to put together a team of experienced developers and cybersecurity folks and sourcing compliance folks, maybe to go through the rules and those policies. Now, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you. This is time consuming and tedious, trust me. It, it's gonna require several meetings, hours long, but it's once. You, you do it once, uh, that's the good part. It's, it's a one-time pain. And once it's done, after it's done, then it's just maintenance. So that's much easier to, then it's just maintenance more. So it's, that's much easier to do then. So really you need, you need to suck it up and do it because those rules, I'm, I'm, I promise you they need to be tweaked. <laughs> They're very strict and they could create a lot of noise that you may not think is, is um, really pertinent to your company or your team. And what this also does, it doesn't create a behavior for your dev teams to ignore, right? So if you, if you, that is the worst thing that could happen is they get conditioned to ignore the scans because it, they basically see it as a bunch of um, what noise. So that's why you really need to clean those, those rules and policies up so that they don't get conditioned to ignore it, that whatever is flagged does need to be addressed, does need to be looked at, right? Any questions there? Nope, looks like you're doing good. We got about 10 minutes left. That should be perfect. So how do I get my company to invest in paying for technical debt? That is the big question, right? And the answer is, it's not about the money you can make. It's about the money you won't lose, right? And it's not, and, and once they understand that, once you're, it's very hard for your product owners to, to get this, I, I've been there. It's like, I want new cool things. 
I want to do this. I want to quick fast the market. I want to attract more customers. Um, but the bottom line is it's about the money you won't lose. And it's not even just about money, right? There's legal exposures that they don't see. There's reputational exposure that they don't see. There's brand exposure that they don't see. Uh, you, there's DevSecOps new favorite example. <laughs> Think Equifax, right? Your company will be the our new Equifax when we do, um, well, you, you don't wanna be them, right? You don't wanna be Equifaxes. You don't wanna be the new Equifax. You don't wanna be the new the new company in all our in all our uh, conferences that we're using as an example, right? And these are things that they don't see or feel, right? They can't put their hands on it, but this is what you need to basically um, explain to your product owners, to your business, that this is what you're risking by ignoring technical debt. You know, Sal, you, you make a really, really good point. I mean, Daniel Kahneman actually wrote a paper that won the Nobel Prize on this kind of thing. <laughs> that what you're looking at here is you're talking to the business now. You're not talking to the developers. And so you're talking at a business level to get them to realize what the exposure is. This is a great slide. And it's because the business is the one that's paying the bill. Right, uh, it's probably true in most companies. Right, they're the ones paying for IT. IT really should be a zero sum shop. Right, they don't make money. They basically a service company internally to um, whatever company you are. Right, you you pay for an IT service. Any questions there? And also, a Lannister always pays his technical debt. <laughs> and that is brings us to open discussion. Um, are there any questions? You know what? Let's actually open this discussion up. Yeah. And uh, I will give people microphone if they request it. And that way, we can actually talk back and forth. Yeah. So let me know okay. if you've got a question here and we can do it. Uh, Elisa's already here, which is nice to see. She's ready to go and she's answering questions in the chat already for you. Oh, fantastic. So that's going great. Thank you. Oh. I always I always like help. Uh, so when you look at the presentation that you're giving here, if somebody could take away one thing from your presentation and actually start implementing it tomorrow, what would you have them do? As far as technical debt? Yeah, huh? I mean, it's, it's the, oh. what do you, how do you start? It's, so I've, 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 I've actually met some folks, or I've talked to some folks about what I was gonna talk about um, at this conference and they were like i've never even heard of that which wow, wow. is kind of hard to believe but th there are some new developers out there that may not e may not be familiar with the concept of technical debt but and there might there's probably a lot of business folks and i know that it's not even a year ago that i left mm. i had to explain technical debt to the business folks mm. at, at my former company and get it? Did they get it? And that is probably <laughs> no, exactly yeah. um, that. And that brings me back to this slide, right? It's get them to understand first what is technical debt, yeah. right? Um, once you get them to understand that what is technical debt and it's not something you could put your hand on your hands on it's not something you can drive around in and show everybody it's not something you can present it's about the money you won't lose 
Okay, I'm gonna jump in because we got a really relevant question from Lincoln on that. And Lincoln, it's a perfect segue here. Is there a way to quantify the cost of technical debt? That is a great question. Yes. I, how do you quantify something that you didn't lose? Right, how did, potentially you could lose, yeah. But I, that is, that I, I totally, I, I, I've thought about that. I've had that same question. I'm like, people have asked that before. Like, how do you quantify it, right? I don't know. I don't know. You don't know what you didn't lose, you, right? What, how do you quantify legal exposure? I guess you could quantify that. Reputation, brand, right? Let, let's back up. Legal exposure is pretty easy. If you've used an open source component, that says, if you use me, you have to give your software away for free. Right. That's absolutely. <laughs> that you can measure on that. Right. Um, the reputation and the brand exposure, you know, those are tough because there isn't any quantifier on that. Right. Exactly. There's... So we do know that Equifax, we have real hard numbers from Equifax, and that's why they're the poster child. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you don't want to be the new poster child yeah i mean equifax is now a verb <laughs> <laughs> uh, and i like those guys i know them so i, I can say that in jest but um you know now it's a, lincoln you have a really really good question that's a business model waiting to happen if you can figure that one out you could if you figure that out please uh put a talk, <laughs> go, uh, please speak at the next conference. Cause I, I, it, that'd be, a, that there'd be a lot of people that would be interested in how you quantify that. It's like, how do you quantify something you didn't lose or don't? Yeah. Yeah. You've got Matt here and Bob who have a discussion going on, which I think is pretty cool. But one of the things that you can do is look at the probability of something happening. And that's what the bean counters do, right? The legal team, it used to be the legal team would look at it and say, if that exposure happens, we're exposed to this much risk. It's going to cost us this much to fix it before it. it's worth taking the risk, right? So the legal team could actually look at it in that sense. But now things are getting so much more complex. I don't know if that's viable anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know if anyone's got this answer about quantifying technical debt. All right. Lincoln, I think you just won the technical debt t-shirt of the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so always good to talk to you. Um, got yeah. a great uh, thing going in the chat. I'm actually going to save the chat for myself because there's a lot of good stuff in there. If you'd like to get hold of chat, uh, <laughs> get hold of chat. If you want to get hold of Sal, <laughs> You can no, uh, yeah, the get the in. answer. <laughs> <laughs> you must have had just a, a pile of jokes once that came out <laughs> about Sal uh, and uh, Breaking Bad. That, you must have just been hammered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I actually didn't. But... No, all right. Good. Thank goodness. <laughs>